we're going to go ahead and introduce our speaker tonight, and then we'll have him go ahead and come up. Tonight, Rex Dutton is here with us. Rex gave me just a short bio about himself. He says, I was baptized young and began preaching as a teenager in Alabama. He says, my wife of 43 years, Deb, and Deb is here tonight. If you hadn't had an opportunity to speak to her, it's a real, real privilege and pre uh, pleasure meeting her. She's just a very sweet lady. And uh, he says that they were married in 1976. They have three kids and five grandchildren. During the late 1970s, while getting our degrees at Alabama Christian College or Faulkner School of Religion, we worked as youth ministers. For the last 40 years, we've been in full-time preaching. The only exception was from 1990 to 1996, <clears throat> when we were also missionaries to South Africa, where we started seven congregations there and worked as lecturers for, this, for the Southern Africa Bible College. Since 1996 till now, we've worked with the Bell Shoals Church of Christ in Brandon, Florida. And if the Lord's will, we will be building a new building and relocating this year. And the congregation then will be known as the Creekside Church of Christ. And so I'll turn everything over to Rex. Good evening, church. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, just want to say thank you for inviting us. Again, we were here last year. Uh, you got a good crowd here, considering that tomorrow is 4th of July. Uh, God bless you. I hope you have a safe and happy 4th. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, I don't mess with fireworks anymore. I've learned better. Don't do that. I don't even like them anymore. <laughs> I don't even like to go watch it anymore. So. And I sure don't like it in the neighborhood when I'm trying to go to sleep at about 12 or 1 in the morning. <laughs> but uh, we live in a great country, don't we? We're all blessed. We really are blessed. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, here, uh, Slate, around various places. And uh, Slate and Julie are, are a great couple. And uh, 25 years or 24, 25 years now, marriage, something in that number. 23? Okay, giving you too much credit there. But <laughs> if, you've, if you've been around that long, you should uh, probably be able to cover... Uh, what I'm covering and a lot better probably. I'm going to be talking to you tonight from Ephesians chapter 5. So if you'll go to Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to be looking really just at one verse. That's kind of my assignment tonight. Ephesians 5 and verse 22, which is just kind of the beginning of uh, that passage. Um, you know, when we talk about marriage, oftentimes we joke about it. And I think the reason we tend to joke about it so much is because it involves such high emotions and such tender ideas that to be very direct uh, about those things, it actually is kind of painful. So we make jokes about it because it makes us feel more at ease. I heard of a couple where they just had this fight, probably y'all never had one, but they just had this fight and said, uh, the husband said, you know, I was a fool when I married you. And the wife said, yes, dear, I know, but I was so in love you, with you at the time, I didn't notice. Um, you know, we, we say things to each other, and we, we laugh about it now, but some of the things we've actually said to each other, we wouldn't want quoted in a book anywhere or on the Internet. A uh, wife said to her husband, uh, No, I don't hate your relatives. In fact, I like your mother-in-law better than I like mine. Some of y'all get that later. Uh, a man uh, wrote into the Reader's Digest this little statement, said uh, he was admiring his reflection in the mirror in the bathroom, and he said, uh, I asked my wife of 30 years, will you still love me when I'm old and fat and balding? And she replied, I do. <laughs> We're talking tonight in this passage uh, in Ephesians 5 and verse 22 is not necessarily a favorite passage when it comes to when we're talking about wives. Um, honestly, I think that even though women seem to want to be married almost more than men do, I think they've probably been treated worse than men as a general rule through the subject of marriage throughout the history of the world. But, um, and you kind of wonder, you know, well, what's God doing? with so much mistreatment of women in 
some of the marriages that there have been. But, and divorce isn't God's perfect will, but divorce is a law that God gave. There is, that comes from him. I didn't invent those scriptures on it. Um, he clearly discusses it. And part of the reason, I think, was because he does care about women so. And he's trying to protect them. I mean, those passages exist, particularly the Old Testament in Exodus 21, Deuteronomy 24, Malachi 2. Uh, it was a part of his will, his law, Deuteronomy particularly. So if God cares for wives, why did he start off this text with submit? You know, you, you wonder, where's his thinking there? So I want to talk about that a little bit. That's what I want to deal with. Uh, submission is actually easier if it's unemotional. Everything, when it gets emotional, it gets harder. Have you noticed? When you get emotional about something, sometimes you can go a place where you really don't need to go. I heard of this uh, one person that was trying to call into a magazine called Theater Arts. Theater Arts magazine. But he didn't have the number. So he called, this back in the day before cell phones. Y'all remember that day? Wasn't that long ago. You remember where you could make a phone call with a quarter? I can remember when it was a dime. You remember that? All right? Then it went to 50 cents, and now you can't find a phone booth anywhere. So, but that's the way it was. And, and so he was calling in because he didn't have what we have. He called the operator to get the number for Theater Art Museum, I mean, magazine. And so he got the operator, and after he asked for Theater Arts Magazine, uh, she said, I'm sorry, there's nobody with the name of Theodore Arts. He's a little frustrated, so he said, well, it, it's not a person, it's a publication. It's Theater Arts. And the operator just raised her voice a few octaves, says, I told you. We don't have a listing for a Theodore Arts. And by this time, the su subscriber that's just trying to get the phone number is so frustrated. He's yelling. The word is theater. T-H-E-A-T-R-E. -E. The operator snaps back and says, that is not the way you spell Theodore. <laughs> Whenever we get emotional and we let it get away from us, we end up, maybe looking at things negatively that aren't that negative. Um, so I think that's true. There's a hidden truth in submission. It's really good. And it's something we need to take a look at. And if you get emotional about it and immediately say, oh, you're just trying to oppress women, well, then you're going to get emotional and then you won't understand any of this. But, and so you have to be careful how you approach it and just accept what it says and then maybe look for the hidden messages in there. We'll look at, we'll see about four little hidden messages here, okay? Uh, in the role of submission in uh, family life. The first one is, and this is what I want to emphasize, is the role, what is that role? What is the role of submission in family life? And the first truth you need to get is, it's a minimal role. I know we, we almost make it like it's the most difficult and the hardest and the biggest thing. And it's actually a minimal role. If you're reading Ephesians 5.22, I've got the New King James. Mine reads like this. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, what you might not have noticed is the word submit isn't in that verse. Uh, it's the word, yours may have the word subject or su be in subjection to. Well, neither subjection nor submit is in that verse. It is in verse 21, it's in verse 23, and it's in verse 24. So the translators, because what it actually says is wives to your own husbands, had to imply from the other texts around it that it's there. And that's the reason that it's kind of written squiggly in your Bible there to indicate that. But that's, it's still there. The thought is still there, but it's, it's not the prominent thing in that particular verse, but it is the prominent message of that verse. So it's not saying uh, women must submit to all men. That's not what this verse says. 
That might be a teaching of the Bible, but it ain't in this verse. <laughs> it's not saying that she must submit to all men in a family, nor that she has to submit to all men at church, nor is it saying that she must submit to all men in the world. That's not taught in this verse. And it's not she must, a wives must submit to all husbands. This text simply says to her own husband, right? So we preach submission a lot better than we actually practice it. And the reason I say it's minimal is because of that. It's not as big a bear as we sometimes make it out to be. And it's not something anybody does so perfectly. It's really not. Uh, and it's better to teach it upward than it is to teach it downward. By that what I mean is it's better for another woman to teach another woman or to teach that way about submission than it is for me to because if I'm talking to my wife and say you need to learn to submit that's not going over real well and she's not gonna say amen but I assure you she would if she could right now so I'm just telling you that's not gonna go over well and if that's the way you approach it it's gonna become a heated thing we're gonna get back to theater and Theodore it's not gonna go well for you uh, we need to learn that we don't submit on any level as well as we sometimes want women to okay that might need to be something we remember we're all minimalists on this subject it's not as strong as we think it's kind of like the whole heard this guy named Samuel Camellison he wrote a story I don't know if it's a true story but it's kind of interesting he said that there was this boy living in India he's really good at playing marbles. Y'all remember playing marbles? I remember playing marbles, but it's kind of going out as I was coming through, but y'all remember marbles? And so if you play marbles and you're any good, you had a special marble, right? And you had to do that to knock the one out, right? You remember that? All right. So he had this special blue marble, which of course he had won a lot of marbles with. And so it was special. He didn't want anybody to take it from him, right? It's the most important marble he's got. Well, he carried around a, just a... His, you know, he kind of leaned to the one side. He had so many marbles in his pocket all the time. He'd won so many, and he always had them with him because he's looking for a good marble game with anybody he could. So he's doing that, and he won many marbles. One day he's walking along with a pocket full of marbles and his blue marble in there, and he came upon a young girl, and the young girl was eating chocolates. And she had a big bag of chocolates. Well, he loved chocolates. And he's like... In his head, he's going, I, I got to figure out a way to get those chocolates. What am I going to do? So he starts up a conversation with him and said, hey, uh, would you, I, I've got a pocket full of marbles. Would you trade me all of your chocolates for all of my marbles? And she said, that sounds like a good deal. Sure. So he realizes he's got his blue marble in there and he reaches in his pocket and he feels that blue one and it has a special feel got a little crack on it and he takes his finger and he pushes it all the way to the bottom of his pocket and he grabs all the marbles up above and so he has all those marbles and he hands her to them she's thrilled she gets the marbles and he takes his chocolate and he turns to walk away he's made a good deal marbles for chocolate and as he turns to walk away it hit him and he turns around to her and says did you give me all the chocolates? See, he kept his blue marble. And so I think sometimes the reason we struggle with thinking someone else has submitted is because we know we haven't done it so well. We kind of struggle with it ourselves. And if you look at the verse just before this, you'll find this isn't a subject just for the wise. This is a subject for us all. So we must realize that we struggle with it. Someone has said marriage is when a man and a woman become as one. The trouble starts when they try to decide which one. Uh, a basic truth of the real submission in family life is it's minimal. It's not the bear we make it out to be. And none of us do it as well as we think we do. We could all do better. And if you think it's not for you, let's look at the next thought. 
So the role of submission in the family is minimal. The second truth is the role of submission in family life is mutual. He says, wives submit to your own husband as the Lord. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 1, it says that the man doesn't have power over his own body but the wife. So there's a submission factor there, isn't there? And the wife doesn't have power over her own body but the husband, right? That's what it says, verse 4. So there's a mutual submission and that's the reason probably we need to all learn this because Ephesians 5 verse 21, the way this starts, it says submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now that, ver that word really is there in that verse. It's really there. It's not supplied. It's there. We need to learn to be subject to each other in the church or in life, whatever we're doing. We need to, the only way you can cooperate is to learn how to submit to somebody occasionally. That's the way it has to be. And so it's not all the time. It's minimal, but you still need to do it because it's mutual. Submission is better understood when it's as for us all. When we only understand submission in a family life as what a woman must do to her husband, we don't understand it. We haven't grasped the attitude and the action that should surround it because there's supposed to be a mutual submission between brethren and in this context within the subject of the family, which is what he's introducing. There needs to be some mutual submission. Stephen P. Beck wrote an uh, article that's really good. He said, he's driving down a country road. Maybe y'all have seen this, because I've seen this in Alabama. I don't know if you've seen this. But he's driving down a country road, and we used to have roads that were so narrow, that only one vehicle could pass on a bridge at a time. Y'all ever seen that? Where you, only one car could get across the bridge at a time? I knew two bridges like that. I remember one time we went over in a bus, and somebody came past us. I don't know how we got past it. But so you, you really, only one vehicle could go over the bridge at a time. Well, he was driving down. He saw it, and right before this bridge that was really a one-lane bridge, it had the sign that said yield. And he saw that, and, but there was nothing coming, so he drove on through, right? And he went on his way. He, after he got through, he came back through. And as he's coming back through, he saw on the side he's coming back through from, right before the bridge, it said yield. He thought, wait a second, I thought it said yield on the other side. And so when he got on the other side, he turned around and he looked and he said, sure enough, it said yield. So on both sides of the bridge, there was a sign that said yield on this side and there's a sign that said yield on this side. Because the truth is, in that situation, if both aren't willing to yield, <laughs> well, you're going to have a problem. You've got to learn to yield. And if you're not willing to yield, there's going to be a problem. And that's true no matter what we do. If you can't yield to other people, there's going to be a problem, and particularly in home life, in marriage. Because it's, it's not just one person. You know, often people don't stop now. Y'all run into that. My, yet, I think it was yesterday or the day before. I pulled up to a stop sign. Guy came up. Zoom, right past me. He didn't, he didn't stop. He said, anybody seen that? So that happened yesterday, and then right after that happened, I went to Walmart, and as I was leaving Walmart, I was going past another, uh, this is a red light. Guy zoomed past me and ran the red light. So that's not just not yielding. <laughs> that's breaking the law in a whole different way. So I think maybe we're struggling in our world with actually yielding to the law even. You know, just basic, because this is dangerous. When you don't learn to yield, when you don't learn to stop, you're going to hurt people, right? That's true at church, by the way. That's true at church. Somebody's going to get hurt, but we can't yield. We can't do it the way the other person. That's true in the home. If I can't yield, if it's always she's got to yield to me, we're going to have problems. Let me, let me give you an example. There's a telemarketer called this home and said, y'all have those telemarketers? Oh my goodness. But anyway, uh, said, I, I'd like to talk to the one who makes the major purchase decisions for your family. And the mom sitting there says, well, I'm sorry, that person is still at kindergarten and won't be home for about another hour. <laughs> but it, she said a real truth. 
The real truth is, is that we all must realize submission is done by everyone in the family. You know, when someone's sick, we all give way to the one sick, right? When someone's hungry and the rest of us eating, we all give way to the one that needs to eat, right? When, when somebody is needy, for whatever reason, we yield to the needy one at that moment. When, when someone is carrying a load, if you see a man carrying a load and he approaches a door and you go through the door before him, you don't understand what I'm talking about, right? What do you do if you see a man or a woman carrying a load? You better hold the door for him if you got any real decency about you, right? The man with the load goes first, right? That's just what you do. That's submitting to other people's needs. So if you think this is a one-way street, gentlemen, it's not a one-way street. There's a yield on both sides of this thing. Ladies, if you think it's a one-way street on your way and that all men should yield to you, you need to understand there's a yield on both sides of this bridge, right? If we're going to have a good family life, then there is a time when we all yield to you. But there's a time when we don't, no matter who you are, no matter what you think. Amen? Amen, Walls. Right? There's a time we say no. There's a time when we will yield to you, no matter whether you're man or woman. That's the way it has to work. It's the only way this text even works. Submitting to one another. Not just, not just submitting to your own husbands. But by the way, that's clear. Your own husband who is yours and you own him and he owns you. Women are no longer considered chattel. Amen? Right. Amen. Third lesson. So, uh, the role of submission in family life is minimal, or at least it should be. It's not that serious. It's not that hard. It is mutual, but it's also metaphorical. There is a message in it, and it's not literal in the normal sense of literal. Let me, let me show you what I mean by that. Then verse 22, wives submit to your own husbands as to. It's not really, your husband isn't literally the Lord. He may be lording, he may be kind of a Lord, but he isn't literally the Lord. It is as to the Lord. And listen to this statement, and I'll show you where it says this again. If you turn over to chapter 6, look at verses 5, 6, and 7. Verse 5 says, Be obedient to those who are your masters according to flesh, with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart, as to Christ. They're not really Christ. It's metaphorical, right? There's a message there. In verse 7 it says, With good will doing service as to the Lord. They're not really the Lord. You're doing it as if they were the Lord. And so, this isn't to be taken absolutely literally, but it's to be taken similarly, in a similar way. It's a metaphorical meaning. Uh, Bob Richardson, for example, uh, was a former uh, New York Yankee. Some of you may be Yankee fans. He's the second baseman. Uh, he, he was at a Fellowship of Christian Athletes meeting, and he led a very short prayer, but it's pretty powerful, and people quoted often. It says, Dear God, your will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Amen. Well, that's a good attitude. That, that ought to be our attitude. So, yes, uh, we ought to be submissive as to the Lord. We ought to be always willing to bend. We ought to always be willing to be subjected to someone else. We ought to always be like that. But it's not that easy. I heard one man who thought himself very godly, and he got up and he often led this prayer at church. It said this, Use me, O Lord, use me in some advisory capacity. <laughs> it's not exactly the idea. So, I mean, basically, I'll give you advice, God. Uh, that's not real submission. Uh, advice is not s submission. We, we must realize that submission, though, is not absolute slavery. It's not. Nobody's your slave at church. And nobody's your slave at home. Your children aren't your slaves. Nobody's your slave. And nobody has absolute, total, tyrannical authority over you. 
the Lord's not a tyrant. None of us should be, right? Just shouldn't be there. So we serve, and that means we serve imper imperfectly. So we go to church, and we all try to cooperate, but we cooperate imperfectly. That's why sometimes people get their feelings hurt. Because we, we do it imperfectly. We don't do everything exactly right. We don't always have a good attitude. We don't always want to mutually submit. We struggle with it from time to time. Especially when we know it's a knucklehead idea, right? Right. Of course, in my opinion, right. So grace and mercy and love saves us all. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try because this text is saying, even though it's metaphorical, it still says as to. So you should try to, right? You should try to submit to those that you're supposed to submit to as to the Lord. But that's not literal. That's the best you can do, right? Because they're imperfect and you're imperfect. That's reality. Absolutely. And, and really, this, that's a good point thing to bring up because that's exactly where we're going to next on this point that respect is a key ingredient in this text especially later in the text because what it does is it shifts the focus on to what a, a husband uh, really needs from his wife is respect but that's true for what a wife needs too by the way we, we all need to be treated with respect and we need to be treated humbly I mean but in our society, it's getting to be harder to find, isn't it? Especially at the stop sign sometimes. Or, I mean, just general respect. I mean, right now, I mean, I've, I don't want to get political because I hate politics. I really do. I just hate it. I don't want to talk about it. But in politics, there, it's getting to the point where nobody can talk about anything without being disrespectful. Doesn't matter what you're talking about. On any subject. On either side. And I don't care what aisle you're on. It's just getting harder and harder to find people to show respect. So that's a problem. And where does it begin? Where do you think all this problem with respect begins? In the home. That's where it begins. And that submission is a teaching too. And where does that begin? In the home. Which is bringing to me uh, the next thought that I really want to focus in on, and that is the role of submission in the family life is missional. There's a mission in it. And that's what this text goes on to really focus in on. If, you, if you're with me now, he says to the Lord, but marriage is a mission. If you go down to verses, if I had time, I'd read 23 through 32, but let's, let's just focus on 32. Do you, are you at 32? It says, basically, this is like right at the very end. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So he's really not even talking about marriage. I mean, yes, he is, but not really. He's really trying to use marriage as a jump off point to teach a great lesson about Christ and the church. And so in, in that, he, he says, though, then he says in verse 33, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respect her husband. So there's a, there's a mission in this. This whole thing, when a, when a husband is the man he's supposed to be, and he's the savior and the appropriate head in the home, and he loves his wife the way he should, and when a wife supports her husband, respects her, respects her, respects him, and then tries to submit in an appropriate way to the best of her ability, there are messages we're sending, particularly at church. If, if at church we're not sending those messages, you know, it's not surprising that the world has some skewed views. If, if we can't get them straight here, you know, it really isn't surprising, is it? Especially if we're not raising our kids in the church or whatever. It, it, it's, it's really not surprising that that would happen. I, I read the Statue of Liberty. Have you ever been to the Statue of Liberty? Anybody been there? Yeah. All right, let me, let me just talk about it just a second because it's kind of neat. It, it, basically, um, 
two great guys basically built it. One was a steel guy basically that built the Eiffel Tower and the other one is the actual artist that made the statue from France and all. But, so you know it's uh, the lady is actually a Roman god. Uh, her name is Libertas, I think. And uh, in her right hand, she has a torch, and uh, that's the light the way. In her left hand is a book, a tablet, and on it, in Roman numerals, it has July the 4th, right? 1776. You might pay attention to that tomorrow. So, uh, so that's what's got on there. What you might not know, unless you've been there, is right at her feet. You know this, right? There are shackles right behind her. Right? And those shackles she's just stepped away from. And that represents the shackles of slavery that America had just stepped away from. Freedom. We no longer supported. Abolitionists had just kicked in. Slavery was abolished. So that's what it represents to us in America which is good for us all. It was dedicated October the 28th, 1886. It's a long time ago, isn't it? October the 28th, 1886. December the 17th, 1903, which is after that, right? 1886, 1903. December the 17th, 1903, two guys, Wilbur and Orville, right? Kitty Hawk. First powered flight. That's interesting that that's after that because if you fly over the Statue of Liberty in a helicopter, and they did not have helicopters in their day, right? If you fly over the Statue of Liberty today and you get really close to the head of Libertas and you look down from the top where in their day, it was never expected that anybody would ever see it. If you look down from the top, her hair is perfectly combed. It is in perfect condition. It's not just flat up there because nobody's ever going to see it. But it is perfect. That is a missional spirit. Nobody's ever going to see whether or not I submit. No, it's in our home. Nobody's ever going to see if I'm respectful. Nobody's ever going to see if I love my wife the way I should. Nobody ever even going to know it unless we tell it. Nobody's going to see it. But the mission is, it doesn't matter if anybody sees it but God. Because just by doing it sends a message, right? By doing it, we send a message that that's what we believe, that's what we want to do, we want to honor who we should honor, right? We want to do the right thing. We must realize that submission has a missional message in this text to show the attitude that the church should have toward Christ. So, a basic truth of the role of submission in family life is it's missional. Okay. Um, let me draw this to a conclusion. I don't know when you're supposed to end. Probably 10 minutes ago. I don't know. But uh, so I looked at it. The, the role of submission in family life is it's to be, it's really minimal. It's not a heavy duty thing. If it is, somebody's pressing you too hard. You're not supposed to be miserable in it. If somebody's making you miserable, they're pushing it too hard. And if you're making yourself miserable because you don't want to submit at all, you're making it too hard. Okay? So it's minimal. It's mutual. We're all supposed to learn how to submit to each other in the fear of God. We're all supposed to do that. Not just women. We're all supposed to learn how to do it. Amen? Amen, Walt? Yeah, that's all right. So, but more than that, it's also metaphorical. It's just as to the Lord, whoever is over you isn't actually the Lord. There is one Lord, and we must submit to him, all right? But the other people, we do the best we can because they're human, and sometimes they're just crazy. Right? And they want stuff that they shouldn't have. All right. But then, but it's also missional. If we do it right, 
then our, our kids catch that. Our kids catch that. The church catches that. And the world catches that. And we send a message to the world about the church and about how our relationship is to be with Jesus. And so it's a great thing to do. But it's not always easy to pull off, is it? No. Uh, let me end with this story. So there's a, there's a tyrannical husband. I know y'all have never known any of this. But uh, there was a tyrannical husband. He had to have his way. It was his way or the highway. He was the boss, you know. So he got married to this young lady. And he had an idea of how that marriage must function and what his wife must do. So he wrote down a list of all of her duties that she must do day by day. What she was expected to do. How she should do them. To what degree. It was a big long list of things that she was to do. Very rigid rules. I don't know what all they were on it. But he, she was given that list. Well what do you think ladies. That uh, she, she thought of that. I'll tell you what she thought. She thought it was horrible. And more. She began to hate him for it. Because he insisted upon it. So she learned to do it, but she hated every minute of it. She learned to do it, but she began to hate him for it. That's what happens when you turn things that you just should do into legal matters, like at church and stuff like that even. But at any rate, that's what happened. And what ended up happening? She was relieved. He died. He died. Everybody dies, right? So he died. And so later, she ran into another man. She fell in love. Married again. God bless her. And this man was just as sweet to her as honey. I mean, they were happy. They were like that happily ever after couple. She had never experienced anything like this. This was wonderful to her. If you've ever... Well, I don't want to say that. Some of y'all might be in one of those miserable marriages right now. But anyway, if, if you've been through it. So he's basically just, she's ecstatic with the guy she's got. Even though she's getting up in age, she's ecstatic. This is a nice guy. And um, so by and by, uh, he's such a nice guy. She's working one day in the house. Guess what she found? She found that list. And she started looking at that list and, you know, kind of got sick in her stomach for a minute. And then she started looking down the list and suddenly it hit her. She was doing everything on that list. And she was loving it. She was doing everything on that list because she loved this man so much. And she had learned to enjoy doing it. Is there a message in there for us? I think there's several, aren't there? Love is to be given with grace, never demanded. It just doesn't work when you demand it. Submission is to be given, never demanded. It just doesn't work when you demand it. It doesn't work. So let's all learn to be gracious, right? Let's all learn to be submissive and gracious. Because when we have that attitude, then we have mutual respect. And we can mutually submit as the case may need to be. So you can preach submission a lot easier than you can practice it. Can't you? So to each other, we need to learn to submit to each other as to Christ. It'll be imperfect, I assure you. Because everything I do for him is imperfect. That's why Jesus died for our sins, amen. And it takes Christ on the cross or none of us have hope. It's called grace for a reason. We need Jesus. We are imperfect. We need because we've got to learn to submit to him and we struggle with that every day. If you're not united in Christ, obviously... The place to begin, which is pretty tough, but it is expected to submit to Christ, right? We are expected to submit to Christ, to surrender to him, to accept that he is the risen Lord and Savior, believe it with all your heart, to 
make an effort to make him the Lord of your life. That's called repentance and to confess that before men and then to be baptized in his name. So that's an invitation that's always available. If there's someone here tonight that needs to respond to that invitation or just needs the prayers of the church, I'm sure we'll try to serve you any way we can at, at the close of this song.